<laughs> Gary Kent is the owner of Meridian Land Consulting LLC. He has been the chair of both the NSPS committee and the ALTA committee on the ALTA ACSM, now NSPS standard since 1995. Gary is a past president of both ACSM and ISPLS, and from 1999 to 2006, he taught boundary law, legal descriptions, property surveying, and land survey systems for Purdue University in Indianapolis. He is in his 35th, no, 13th year on the Indiana State Board of Registration for Professional Surveying and is frequently called on as an expert witness in cases involving boundaries, easements, land surveying practice. Gary regularly presents programs across the country and on Mentoring Mondays <laughs> and on surveying topics and writes columns for the American Surveyor and contributes to the NSPS News and Views. Um, such a really good topic. I, uh, I appreciate you taking your time again to, tonight, Gary, before you fly out tomorrow to start your circuit. <laughs> so All right. thanks yeah. for joining us. I uh, much appreciated the opportunity to catch you all on uh, on the day before Terminalia. Exactly. Right, which is uh, the date of the festival for the Roman god Terminus, which is uh, why we picked February 23rd for our effective date of the standards. I think that's been the last uh, three versions, or 2011, 16, and, and this one. Uh, just earlier today, I spent an hour and a quarter with the American College of Mortgage Attorneys. So I'm hoping that we've got word out to them on, uh, on the standards. Oh. There were over, uh, over 100 of them there. So that's kind of encouraging. Nice. Um, what we're going to do uh, tonight is I'm going to give you a really brief overview of the 2021 standards. Uh, uh, if you have the opportunity, get to your state conference or the regional conference that's going to be um, out there in the cloud somewhere. I'll be uh, speaking, actually, but I don't think I'm speaking on the standards on that one. Uh, but um, try and find it out there. I've done eight-hour programs. I've done four-hour programs. I've done two-hour programs. I've done one-hour programs. And um, trying to get, get the word out so everybody's kind of tuned in with, uh, with the changes. We're going to hit kind of the highlights tonight and, um, and maybe whet your appetite to look more. The red line version that Trent has put out is normally when I do this program, that's what I work with because then we can just page right down through it and see exactly what all the changes are. Uh, for this program tonight, I've just got a, a dozen or so slides that are gonna hit the highlights and I'll be more than happy to take questions as uh, as we normally do. So with that, let me uh, share my screen. So I do, I'm, I just pulled up the program and you're presenting on a Saturday on ALTA update. <laughs> I am, okay, I, at, the, uh, at the seven state? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, uh, so that's, see that's uh, in my mind, that's like next year trend. So, I know, uh, I know, <laughs> I get it. The art of the retracement is uh, the morning of um, the Saturday morning and then you're doing the update, uh, the ALTA update in the Saturday afternoon. Okay, so, good, Yep. good. All right, um, yeah, and I noticed uh, one of my students, my former students from uh, 20 years ago, Rod is on here and uh, I know Jim is on here somewhere from Nashville, so we've got a crowd. So let's, let's hit the, uh, the highlights here. Um, this is our 10th version of the standards. A, a little background for those of you who don't know, uh, there is a joint committee between ALTA and NSPS. I've chaired that committee since 1995. Uh, which seems like a long time, but the person who chaired it in front of me probably chaired it uh, for maybe that long also. Uh, and she was about 90 something when she uh, retired. And I'm actually not joking about that. Um, so 2021, it takes uh, about two years for that joint committee to work through it. The committee is uh, comprised of about 12, 15 attorneys representing title companies and lenders. And then there are a variety of surveyors involved. The, the direct members of that committee 
uh, have been myself, uh, Kurt Sumner, Executive Director of NSPS. Um, let's see, who do we have this time? Judy Beal, who is uh, in Virginia Beach, I think with Wolpert, a friend of mine who does a lot of land title surveys. Um, Todd Rackstad, who some of you know with the Salt River Project in the Valley up uh, out there. And then Paul Byrne, who some of you probably also know who is in Vegas. Uh, and they do their own types of land title surveys. So we have a really good variety and a, a really committed group uh, who has been involved this time around. Uh, in addition to that, there is a subcommittee with NSPS that is responsible for the standards. Uh, and that committee kind of works in parallel with the official joint committee, looking at the suggestions and giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, in addition to that, I have about 300 surveyors uh, in an email distribution that I use, and they also get copies of all this stuff <clears throat> and have the ability to review it and comment and make their own suggestions. Uh, the list of suggestions this time got up to be, I think, about 14 pages long, uh, which is an improvement. In 2011, I think we had 27 pages of suggestions, which is interesting because the standards are only nine pages long. Uh, uh, when, there, when it's a thumbs up, when the committee decides it is a, a suggestion that we should work into the standards, and I'm normally drafting the wording, which then gets kicked around and and um, up and down and around to, uh, to some resolution. If it's a thumbs down, I actually make a note in the list of suggestions as to why it was turned down. Uh, I will tell you that the most common reason that we don't accept a suggestion is because it's either considered to be a contractual issue or a practice issue. For example, we've had suggestions that, that the standards should say that the surveyor is only going to certify to the lender, the title company, and the buyer or the owner if it's a refi. Um, we don't feel that's appropriate in the standards. We, we've listed who needs to be certified to, but if the surveyor wants to, to certify to more parties and charge for it even, then they should be allowed to. So that's, that's kind of an example of that. Uh, this time around, all of the changes that I can think of were to the benefit of surveyors, which is actually the, the, uh, the situation last time. Also, um, in the way that it either is um, cutting out liability that does not belong to us, uh, and every time we're, you know, we're working on that, or it's making requirements more clear and uh, so that we have fewer questions. And that's how the list of suggestions uh, comes about sometimes is uh, by me doing programs like this and people raise their hand, they ask a question just today, actually, I had uh, two more suggestions which were really, really good suggestions uh, and I've added them to my list. Um, so that, that is an ongoing list. I do not vet those suggestions, by the way. I, uh, I, I get suggestions sometimes and I'm like, boy, that is really not a very good one. Uh, and the committee is not going to accept that, but I, it goes on the list anyway. So that's my commitment to everyone. Um, 25 years uh, uh, chairing the committee. I've told them this is my last time around doing this and um, I will, uh, I'll still be involved, but I will not be chairing this next time uh, is uh, my plan at least. I think I know who will be the new chair. Uh, it's a surveyor again, uh, who also is involved with title. So that's a good thing. The structure, we've stuck with the structure that we adopted in 2011, uh, a, a, a number of changes, some significant ones that we will briefly go through. But the, uh, the, the structure we adopted nine years ago, 10 years ago now has actually held up well. So we're, we're pleased with that. Uh, I saw a uh, chat. Uh, uh, yeah. Trent, you may watch the chat and let yeah. me know if there's a question. Steve, Steve wanted to know kind of the primary reasons why the uh, <clears throat> updated, they're updated so frequently. Uh, they're only updated every five years. And uh, that's our commitment, unless something uh, egregious is discovered that needs to be addressed, uh, it's every five years, which is actually a pretty long time considering I end up with, uh, you know, 14, 15 pages of suggestions during that period of time. Um, 
we often identify things that really need to be addressed. Uh, sometimes you all don't realize it. There's a couple changes this time that, that put uh, surveyors in a liability situation that I don't think anybody probably really realizes. And so we needed to take care of that. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, there are situations where I'll get uh, questions about some clause in the standards time and time and time again, which tells me we, we need to look at it because apparently it's not as clearly stated as what we thought. So that's, uh, you know, that's the impetus and uh, we're not stuck on five years, but that seems to be a pretty good time frame uh, to, to do it in. And uh, I don't know, from my standpoint, it doesn't seem like it happens quickly, but, uh, but again, it takes about two years to go through it. So in three years, we'll probably be starting on, uh, on the 2026 standards, which I already have a page and a half of suggestions on, by the way. So um, yeah, that's kind of like welcome to my world. <laughs> and they're not even out yet. <laughs> they're, they're not even out yet. Not even a page yeah. and a half. Uh, <laughs> and, and there's some good, there's some actually good suggestions. Nice. Um, so uh, let me introduce you to shall and must. When you look at the red line version, you're going to see that we have gone through the standards and uh, found every occasion of the word shall. And most of them we changed to must. Uh, the reason for that, we're a little behind the eight ball on this, but there was a US Supreme Court uh, decision in 1995, a case called Gutierrez de Martinez v. Lamagno. And part of that decision revolved around the use of the word shall in a, I think it was in a contract, I don't remember right offhand. But the court's determination, the decision was that shall uh, is in fact not an imperative. An imperative is a, essentially a command. Uh, you know, if, if it said shall, then you, you have to do it. Uh, and with that Supreme Court case, uh, shall is no longer an imperative. So we needed to look through every use of the word shall and, and see, did we intend on that being a command, a must do? And if, if, it, uh, if it was, then we changed it to the word must. Uh, so I, I point that out because sometimes we make changes like this and people think there's some hidden agenda, you know, oh, what's up with that? Uh, there's nothing up with that other than the U.S. Supreme Court said that uh, if you're saying shall and you uh, and it is intended on being something someone has to do, uh, you better use the word must, uh, which means I guess we better look at the Ten Commandments, by the way. So, uh, an, Another thing you will see and somebody actually today with the uh, mortgage attorneys asked this question, uh, the last line of, of section two, we, we uh, tweaked it just a little bit, but it talks uh, to the issue of the client perhaps needing to uh, provide for access. I think it says the client shall arrange for access. Uh, shall was the correct word there because we can't direct them to arrange for access if they can't get it, for example. But uh, the reason I point this out because later in the standards in at least one occasion, we had similar wording about the client needing to arrange uh, permission for access. We have stricken those subsequent ones. We felt those were redundant and we have simply addressed it right here in section two. Uh, today, one of the mortgage attorneys said, uh, gosh, you know, why has that been removed? I think it was in table A, uh, I don't remember which one, table A item uh, 18, I think. Uh, we had stricken it and they said, why, why did you take that out? And I said, because it's redundant. We've already addressed that issue. So uh, in section three, we uh, made some clarification and a simplification of relative positional precision. Uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail on it, but uh, suffice it to say that we are, it, it is revolving around the concept of local accuracy which is a relatively new term in the geodetic world, but it, it, is, un, it is understood what it means. Uh, and it answers a question that, that I think the standards left kind of hanging open for a long time. It bothered me and I wasn't really sure what to do about it. And then I engaged with uh, 
Um, Earl Burkholder uh, was retired from New Mexico State. We worked on this for some time and, uh, and adopted some additional wording. Uh, so it, it, it really kind of simplifies the analysis, number one. And number two, it also provides for a, a quite a, a definitive explanation of, um, of the possibilities of how you would uh, do the calculation. Nobody is going to, to calculate the full covariance matrix uh, between two points, but, uh, but that kind of nails the whole thing down. Um, so you'll see quite a bit of red in section, uh, what, 3E1, uh, 3E Romanesque 1. Uh, it's, it's not uh, something probably that's going to affect anybody. It just makes the definition uh, stronger and clearer in case we ever got challenged on it. Uh, again, if you look at records research, that almost that entire section is red. And you'll look at that and say, oh my God, we, they rewrote the entire thing. No, actually we hardly changed anything. Uh, there were some documents that were uh, required to be provided to the surveyor that were not part of the list. They were buried up in that introductory paragraph to section four. And we felt that it made more sense to pull those out and actually just make them part of the list. So what happened then that bumped all the, all the items down and we did a little bit of rewording, but it, that, that uh, research section is almost exactly what it was before. We have just uh, uh, made a, uh, a clear list rather than having some of the elements kind of buried up there in, a, in one of the sentences. The field work, uh, we still have seven subsections to that. Uh, I think it's uh, encouraging that 5A and 5B, uh, there were no changes to. Uh, I, I don't know if we actually had any suggestions. I'd have to go back and look. But if there were, the, the committees did not feel that they were something that needed to be addressed. And so if you look at 5A and 5B, there are absolutely no changes. And, uh, and that's pretty encouraging. On uh, we did make a couple uh, minor changes in 5C, which I'll, I'll get to here in a few minutes. But uh, in 5E, we did uh, do a couple of uh, significant things here. Uh, in 5E2 uh, in easements, we, uh, we're, we're always aiming for objective factual information from the surveyor so that we're not putting ourselves in a situation where we're kind of giving uh, an opinion. Uh, we understand that our boundary uh, uh, determination is by definition a professional opinion, but the requirements we don't want, you know, we want those to be definitively stated. And we had a piece in 5E Romanesque 2 that talked about whether something appeared to affect the property. Well, that's that's a pretty subjective um, measure, and we didn't want that in there, and so we replaced that with um, with the easement uh, uh, making a note if it's on or across, which is factual objective. So that was a change we made to that. Uh, in section five C Romanesque three, I believe we make mention of utility poles and we say to reference 5E Romanesque 4. Uh, what happened on utility poles, if you all remember in 2016 in uh, 5E4, we made uh, locating and showing all evidence of utilities on the property and within five feet of the boundary of the property, we made that mandatory in 2016. So the manholes, the pedestals, the transformers, the the guys, the, the uh, uh, utility poles, the meters, the valves, all that stuff needs to be uh, shown if it's on the property or it's within five feet of the property. Now, one of the things that happened when we pulled that, um, what do you wanna call it? The uh, observed evidence of utilities, when we pulled that out yeah. of table A, and stuck it up here, we inadvertently left some things dangling out there in table A in item 11. 
And one of them was the requirement to locate utility poles within 10 feet of the property. So that had hung around down there in table A and we should have pulled that up into the standards. So the requirement now is that we show all utility features that are on the property, all utility features within five feet of the property, except utilities, which are to be shown if they're within 10 feet of the property. The reason for that is the cross arms, which we know, you know, most people locate a utility pole and then we show a dash line to the next utility pole and we say, you know, there's your overhead when in reality there's an eight foot cross arm up there with, uh, with eight electrical lines uh, and telephone lines across it. So uh, we pulled that stuff up into 5D4 to clarify that. Uh, the other thing we did in uh, in 5E is we made utility locate markings, which of course is normally paint, but it might be flags, it might even be chalk. We have a client requires chalk for utility locates. Uh, those are now to be treated as evidence of utilities, which I think is a, is a logical thing. We know if we do a survey and there is a blue paint stripe across the parking lot that there's probably a water line there. And so we should be uh, showing that just as if there was a meter or some, some other evidence. So that's, a, uh, that's something that we added in 5E, evidence of utilities, evidence of easements. Um, for those who are concerned about you know, where did that uh, paint mark come from, the requirement is to indicate where it came from uh, with the note that if you don't know where it came from. And in the FAQs, I've even written an example note that we might write that says, hey, we're showing uh, paint marks on here that uh, appear to be typical paint marks for a utility locate, uh, but we actually don't know where they came from. So rely on them uh, at your own risk. Hey, Gary, while you're right there, so that's, uh, Mike, yeah. had a, Mike had a raised his hand, he had a question. Okay. Yeah. So, so Gary, do you think, and that's not really clear, but do you think the due diligence on doing an Alta and SPS survey is to request locates from the utilities, particularly underground? I know in our area, of course, we're Alaska, we're the last ones out here. The record documents are really poor in a lot of cases for some of the utilities, depending on location, the more rural that you get. So, they do have a lot of times, you know, a 811 call and get utility right. locate. So it's not really mentioned in the standards if that's a shall or recommended, you know, or yeah, so, that, so that's a good question, bus, but to get, but to get the, a call out for underground utilities. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And, and that's the second time I've been asked that question. So it makes me think I might want to put a note and, and look to clarify that next time around. But um, no, all 5E says is treat paint marks as if they are evidence. It, it, it is not intended that uh, anything in the main part of the standards or actually in table A as we'll find later, um, no uh, consideration for an 811 locate. Uh, I'll, I'll explain more about that later, but, um, but no, with respect to 5E and doing the field work locating evidence of utilities, we're just treating paint marks as if it's a valve or a manhole. Uh, we're gonna locate them, we're gonna show them, but uh, there's no, uh, no intent there that that involve an 811 locate request. Thank you. And surveyors, we hate to ignore evidence, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, that, I think that was our concern is that we see paint marks and we see flags and we know, <laughs> we know there's a pretty high probability that that's evidence uh, from someone and, um, and we decided that is appropriate to be locating and showing. So, uh, is there another uh, uh, question, Trent? A couple of them, it looks like maybe. Oh, there we go. Um... Do we want to, should we hold off until you get to the, basically the section or table A11? On some yeah, let's do that. Let's do okay. that. Because yeah, because these are all, uh, yeah, these are all kind of, related yeah, they're all that. utility related. Okay. So um, okay. timing is off. Okay, yeah, let's, these are all utilities. All right. So we'll wait till we all get right. to so 11. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to those when we get to table A then. Yep. 
Uh, in section six, there are four subsections. Again, same as, there, as it was before, uh, no changes to that. Uh, there are some important changes in section six, though I say no changes, meaning A, B, C, D, that, that structure is still there. In uh, 6C, Romanesque 2, we have done two things that will benefit uh, everyone. One of them is that I, I would guess that some of you on this call have been asked by a lender to list every single Schedule B2 item in the title commitment. Uh, whether it's a lien or taxes or whatever, they want that stuff listed. Uh, in my book, that's a ridiculously stupid request. This is a survey. It deals with survey stuff. And so uh, what we've done in Roman S2 is we said that we are going to uh, provide a summary of all rights of way easements. And uh, actually that still says servitudes, but we replace servitudes with others matters of survey, I believe is what it says. So what we're trying to do is help you all push back on requests. I, I, I did a land title survey three years ago that had 134 Schedule B2 items. And um, if they'd have asked me to do that, I would have just flat told them I wasn't doing it. But, um, you know, a lenders we know can be pretty, uh, you know, pretty pushy. Uh, so we're trying to help you all uh, and provide you some ammunition to say, no, no, this is a survey. We're going to deal with the plottable issues, not, not the other stuff. Uh, the other thing that we changed here was, um, has to do with uh, the word effects. And in the list, so we reworded the, the introduction to that little list uh, with some stuff, but this is when we're listing out the matters of survey in the title commitment. And, you know, it's items uh, 5, 6, 11, and 17. Those are the, the easements that are in there. And we list what it is and we put the recording information and we say that it's on the property or you know, shown here on as something that we say at Schneider. Um, and then we say with a note, you know, if under, there are some other things that would be helpful to the person reviewing the survey, like, like basically don't look for it because it's a blanket easement, it covers the whole property, or don't look for it because we can't figure out from the document where it's actually located. Uh, one of the things that we said in there, in keeping with the objective, uh, you know, factual nature of what we're trying to do here, is to state whether an easement is, uh, you know, was not on or touching the property. So it's listed in Schedule B two, and they rely on us to help them sort this out. So we look at it and say, no, it's it's not on. It's you know, it's somewhere else. Uh, but lenders are often hung up with the word af. Effect. They want us to tell them if it affects the property. I have always pushed back on that word because you can look at effects in two ways. One of them is it on the property, right? That's one way to look at it. The other is the legal effect of the easement. For example, I don't know about you all, but I don't run the chain of title on an easement that was granted in 1924 to see if the person who granted it actually owned the property. And I doubt that the title company runs that chain of title either. So there may be an easement listed in there that uh, was granted by somebody who only had a five, you know, 10, 25% interest in the property, or maybe they sold it. And then they said, oh crap, I was supposed to dedicate this easement uh, before I sold it. Let me just go ahead and do that. And they granted an easement. They didn't even own the property. Uh, in that case, the easement may plot on the property, but technically it doesn't affect it because it's not even a valid easement. Uh, this is why I always shied away from the word effects, and yet lenders often are kind of hung up on that word. So what we did is we said, uh, put a note that says it's not on or touching the property or that it doesn't affect the property based purely on where it plots. So what we've done is we framed the use of the word effect to eliminate uh, somebody saying, well, you said it affects and actually it's an invalid easement, so you're wrong. Now we're gonna use the word effect just in the context of uh, where it plots on the property. So I think those are a couple of good changes there. 
Uh, I see there's a, uh, a bunch of more questions and maybe there is anything I need to address here at the moment. Okay. All right, a new sub item, a new Romanesque under 6C. Uh, this is another one that has been problematic for surveyors. And uh, uh, this is the one where you have come across an easement, maybe in your research or maybe because you surveyed the property next door or you surveyed this property previously, uh, you have reason to believe there's an easement across this property, but it's not listed in Schedule B2. Now, this happens one of two ways. One way is that the, um, uh, it was in Schedule B2 and then you got a revision and it's been removed. Uh, the other way is that you just stumbled across it and it's not in Schedule B2 and you're kind of wondering why. So the requirement is if we, if we come across this that we contact the title company and say, hey, I found this easement. Now I'll tell you one of three things is gonna happen. One is they're gonna say, oh God, thank you, we missed that. And then they're gonna add it to Schedule B2. And the second thing that might happen is they might say, oh yeah, that's been released or that's been vacated or that's been abandoned. And uh, in which case I would ask them to just send me a copy of that so I don't you know, stumble into this again. The third thing, however, that might happen is that they say, yeah, we're aware of that, but we're insuring over it or writing over it, meaning that they have been pressured by the uh, lender uh, to look carefully at that easement and make a business decision that the risk is low. Maybe it's a really old easement, it's a gas easement, there's no gas line there. Um, it's so old they are having trouble figuring out even who has rights to it. And so the lender convinces them to basically pretend like they never saw that easement and just uh, remove it as an exception. And if something comes up, the title company is gonna have to, to cover that. The problem is, what do we do then, right? Because essentially we found an easement, nobody can tell us that it no longer exists and yet it's not listed in the title commitment. So what this one says is we have to contact the title company and say, hey, found this easement. And if they cannot provide evidence that it no longer exists, it's been released or it's been um, vacated. If they can't provide that, then we need to go ahead and either show it or explain uh, the facts about this easement on the face of the document with a note that the title company has been alerted to this. And I would probably suggest it'd be good to add a note that says that, oh, by the way, this is not listed in the title commitment. Mike's so got that another gets, question. yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Mike's got another question. Yes, <clears throat> so in our state, we had a lot of big blanket easements, utility come in and right probably large parcels, original parcels out of federal blanket easement for some utility. Now we have some subdivided piece, but a blanket easement still on title. Is there any guidance on that just other than maybe list it? Does yeah, no. It, it, show it's up on the title commitment, but it's like, what do you do with this? Yeah, no, you just list it as being a uh, we have tons of them also on the north side of Indianapolis, mostly pipeline easements that, that uh, came across here. And they were blanket easements. And as it develops, of course, they get uh, partial releases and down to, I, in fact, I just was on Monday out on a survey where there had been a partial release on an easement. Uh, and so uh, if it's a blanket easement, we would list it. We would say transmission line easement, uh, deed record 157, page 683, um, blanket easement. And, uh, and I think that's all you need to say then. That, that tells them that it's, uh, you could even say, um, you know, that it, that it affects the property uh, because we have qualified that, that it, you know, it, 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 you look at the description, yeah, it covers this piece of property, um, but you would note that it's a blanket easement. So they're not looking around on the survey trying to find it because they're not gonna find it. It covers the whole property. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Travis, Travis had one more in here. Uh, do you keep your B2 responses limited to the wording in the standards or do you expand on them, i.e. cannot determine from record document because the surveyed property is not specifically mentioned and that additional research would be necessary? So just how, I guess- Yeah, how, I, I don't think- 
yeah, no, I, I don't think there's any harm in expounding on your explanation to make if you if you need it to make it more clear. Uh, so I think in the standards it says that you, you know it's not not cannot be located based on the document or something to that effect. Uh, if uh, if you need to say you know be or feel like it would be helpful to say because of this, uh, I think that's entirely appropriate. I, there's no no problem with adding more explanation in there. Yeah, make it uh, the old adage: make it defendable on the map when it whatever you need. Yeah, to you yeah. want make it, it defendable. To, yeah, yeah, you absolutely want it to be factual so that somebody can't say, "Well, you misled us." You know, no, I, I I want it to be a note that I can say, "No, what I wrote in that note is absolutely true." Yeah. Uh, that's the that's the main point. Perfect. Uh, in Table A, we got rid of two ba Table A items. Um, one of them was a sub item, but the other one was an item. So there are no longer 20 items. There are now only 19 items. Uh, the, if you negotiate an additional item, uh, that will be 20 or 20A. If there are three of them, there'll be 20A, 20B, 20C, not 20, 21, 22, because that confuses things. Uh, the other thing we did, and when I first got involved in the standards, it was in 1988, and it was because of what is now Table A. It started off as Table 3, but they were going to introduce that table, and I was concerned because there wasn't, no, there was nothing qualifying anything in there. And uh, so I went to the committee meeting. It was in Virginia Beach, and they invited me in, and, and I expressed my concern, and so we sat down and uh, came up with what ha is now that note that leads into table A. Uh, I was surprised in our work on the standards this time around that there was not an understanding that the actual wording of those items is negotiable. Not just whether you're gonna do it or not, not how much they're gonna pay for it, but the actual wording. Uh, and that, that, if you think about it, it makes sense because after all, it's an optional item anyway. So we made it patently clear with the new wording that, that uh, in that note that the actual wording of a table A item is in fact negotiable. Now, if you negotiate it, then you need to have a note pursuant to 6D, uh, uh, some number 6D something, well, you need to have a note that says, oh, by the way, with respect to this table A item, uh, we negotiated a change in the wording and here's what we actually did. That's important because somebody pick up that survey in a few years and uh, look at you, the fact that you certified to a certain item and they think they're looking at something that they're not looking at because you didn't do exactly what that item said. You negotiated a change in that. Uh, the primary changes in table A, the zoning, the, the uh, those of you familiar know that in 2016, we said that we needed to be provided a zoning letter or a zoning report. Uh, a zoning letter typically comes from the jurisdiction. They're usually not very helpful. A zoning report, uh, there are companies out there, just like there are some companies that you can hire to get a flood determination. There are companies out there that produce zoning reports. Um, what unfortunately happened was that we have clients now who just want to dump the entire zoning ordinance in our lap and tell us to figure it out. I can assure you that is not what we had in mind in 2016. So we tweaked the wording in uh, 6A and 6B. And the wording now says that there has to be a zoning report or zoning letter that is specific to the property being surveyed. So, uh, so we're hopefully going to eliminate this stuff where people just want to dump the zoning ordinance in our lap and tell us to interpret and figure out what applies to the property. So I think that's a good change for all of us. Now, if you're a company that specializes in zoning in your city, uh, have at it. You know, you can negotiate a change in that. Uh, party wall. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike's got one more. Yeah, that'd be a good place to put the word must. Right in front of the must be provided by the client or the client's representative. Uh, yeah, is that does it not say that? Uh, in your slide, it does, and I have to go back and look at your. No, uh, I uh, looking at the standard says if. Um, let's see. If they want this information, a zoning reporter letter specific to the surveyed property must be. I think it does say that. Uh, 
look in here. Uh, 6A, I think, says uh, if they want uh, the uh, classification, uh, setbacks, height, floor space area, and parking, uh, that information must be. Does it say that? No. Sure it does. No, I'm looking at the red line version, but then the, the word must is nowhere in that paragraph. All right. Well, I'll, I'll make a note about that because uh, <laughs> there are some places, some things that we ended up changing. And I know of another place where we changed something and then kind of missed the fact that we should have had a must in there. Yeah, I just make it clear that it's their responsibility. That's, I think, the whole point you're getting at, that the surveyor isn't going to go chase his zoning down. Right. I will uh, look at that. Okay. Uh, one of the items we eliminated was the plumness item in 11B, or I'm sorry, in 10B. This was uh, 10A had to do with party walls, 10B had to do with plumbness. The client is supposed to tell us uh, which walls they're concerned about not being plumb. They never do. They just check that item off and then you're doing a survey of a one-story brick building. Uh, we debated on how to make that better and ALTA said, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with title uh, unless it's leaning over the line, in which case we have to locate it anyway pursuant to 5C. Um, you know, the locating things in close proximity to the boundary. Uh, so we just eliminated it. And if it turns out the client does have a concern about the plumbness of a wall, then they can negotiate that as an extra item on table A item uh, 20. Uh, the last item I think, no, well, there's two more, but utilities. Uh, we probably spent more time on utility item uh, 11 than anything else in the standards. This has been a problem that got introduced in 1988. It's been a problem ever since then. We've probably tweaked it almost every time we have uh, done things with the standards. Uh, we looked at it again and said, how can we do this? The problem is a couple things. One of them is that when people check this item off, they think they are going to get accurate, complete, and reliable information from us on the underground utilities. And in fact, we know that it's going to be inaccurate, incomplete, and unreliable information. So we wrote that note uh, several years back that follows table A item 11 uh, to try and help manage their expectations. And I, I personally put that note right in my contract. I also put the note on the face of the survey so that uh, we're you know, doing all we can to control their expectations. Uh, what we did this time, the other thing that we did that, that was a, an issue, number one, their expectations. Number two, that in most of the United States, a request for an 811 locate from a surveyor is not a very effective thing to do. Uh, that is not the case everywhere, but it is the case probably in the majority uh, certainly in urban and suburban areas in most states, this is a problem. So we eliminated that as an option. Uh, now, if you remember in 2016, we just had, um, we didn't have any options. You checked off the item and it said we were gonna locate, we we're gonna show the utilities based on the observed evidence, which we already had to do, plans uh, requested by the surveyor and an 811 locate request. Um, what we've done this time is we've reworded it to make it more clear that if all they want is observed evidence, they don't need to ask for that because that's one of the problems we had in 2016 was that people, uh, lenders would look at and say, wait a minute, I, I just want the observed evidence. Uh, can you modify table A item 11 to just include the observed evidence? Uh, it's a ridiculous request because we already had to locate the observed evidence pursuant to section 5e Romanesque 4, uh, but they were still hung up on that. So we said, what can we do to, to clear this up? So you'll see that in the uh, lead in uh, sentence to table A item 11, it says, we're gonna show the evidence of utilities uh, based on uh, the, uh, and, and we say the observed evidence, which we already provided pursuant to 5e Romanesque 4, and then we give them two choices. One is uh, we will review plans, utility plans that they provide to us. 
And two is we will help coordinate a private utility locate request. In other words, you know, the, the 811 request, which is gonna get an incomplete response at best in many cases, the private locate request, uh, they will respond because we're paying them, right? So if somebody checks off 11B, we need to have a little conversation about, okay, how's this gonna happen? Is this gonna be part of our fee? Are you paying for it? We'll help coordinate it. Uh, of course, the other problem, by the way, with an 811 locate is uh, they generally are not gonna go on the private property. If you're surveying an apartment complex, they're not gonna generally mark the utilities all across that complex. They're gonna mark them in the public uh, rights of way. So those are the two choices now. Keep in mind that those are negotiable. So if you're in an area where an 81 locate uh, request is effective, then modify table A item 11B and, and change it to say an 811 locate. Um, or you could just do that with a, an additional um, table A item 20. But that's, uh, that's what we've done with that. We had one person on the committee who was pretty vocal that we needed to change this. We had a ton of suggestions about this item because everybody knew it's problematic. Um, the, the one uh, uh, member of the committee who is quite vocal is happy with what we've done. Uh, is this going to work? I don't know, uh, we, we'll see. We may be tweaking it again in uh, in 2026, um, the, I did make a big deal about this with the mortgage attorneys pointing out that I know, you know, there's a utility endorsement. The title company issues an endorsement based on this information. The lender's very concerned about utilities, but I made a point of telling them, we don't have x-ray vision any more than they do, right? We can look at a set of plans. Everybody on this call knows that how as-builts get created. They stamp the construction plans as-built. And everybody on this call knows that they didn't put those utilities in where they, where they say on the plans. Uh, so, you know, it's just in addition to the fact that I did inform them that a utility locate on an 811, I think is a plus or minus two feet at best. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to, uh, to help. We're trying to, in the standards, help uh, manage expectations as best that we can here. Uh, the wetlands item, which was 18, that's the one we got rid of. If you are with a firm that offers this service, then go ahead and offer it, negotiate it, include it as table A item 20, but it's not a uh, typically a title issue. Actually, ALTA is the one who said, why don't we just get rid of it? It's not a title issue. We don't care. It's uh, We were going to work on it again to try and tweak it because the problem with it is People check that item off and think that the surveyor is miraculously going to turn into a wetlands biologist and tell them where all of the uh, wetlands are. And then they're upset when we're not doing that and tell them they're, you know, that's a different consultant. It's going to cost more money. And they think that we're supposed to do that when they check off this item. So this one has been eliminated. Uh, if you offer the service, then have at it. But for the rest of us, uh, we're going to get out of that box. Uh, there's my information. So it looked like we have a ton of questions. Um, yeah, before uh, before we go on, I'm sure one big question, right? They go into effect tomorrow, but I signed a contract today. Yeah, so uh, in the FAQs, and I will tell you, actually, I can show you. Um, I don't know if Trish did that today or not. Um, in the FAQs, we give some guidance on, um, I'm, I'm gonna go to the NSPS website here real quick. We give some guidance on how to deal with this issue. Um, my suggestion is if you were under contract before <clears throat> tomorrow, then you are perfectly within your rights to do it as a 2016 and to finish it up as a 2016. Uh, on the other hand, if you were negotiating two days ago, uh, obviously you're not gonna get the survey done in two days. You could have gone ahead and written it up as a 21 standards, although really nobody probably knows those exist yet. So uh, they'd probably wonder what you were talking about. Uh, I'm going to uh, reshare uh, this so I can help with this. But So this is the NSPS website, uh, nsps.us.com. If you go to resources over here across the top and you go down to standards, you will see ALTA NSPS. Yeah, she did get this today. So- uh, Yeah, I just looked, they're updated. Yeah, 
Uh, so we have three choices over here. Um, you can go to the standards, which has the clean version of the standards. It also has the red line version. And I think you have both of those. Uh, and we've got a Word version and a PDF if you want. I will, by the way, point out the standards are copyrighted, but ALTA, both ALTA and NSPS allow for uh, education purposes and company branding uh, that you can use them right, without, without permission. Uh, so that's the... Uh, that's what you'll find on that page, in addition to uh, a bunch of comments, mainly the stuff I've, uh, a lot of stuff I've just talked about this evening or this afternoon for most of you. Um, the other, we've got FAQs. Now, we had a set of FAQs from 2016. Many of them were still valid. Uh, I wrote a, an FAQ for uh, 21. Uh, so what I did uh, earlier, Week, actually last week I combined those two and I kept the FAQs that were still valid uh, and added the one specific to 2021. So there's a fairly comprehensive list you can see here. They are in order of uh, sections one through five and table A, but the very first uh, FAQ here is what about the transition period? Um, now, my uh, I, I, a couple comments. So we're, they go into effect tomorrow. So a new contract as of tomorrow uh, needs to be to the 21 standards. Uh, Section 3E Romanesque 1 of the standards says as of tomorrow, the previous versions don't exist. Uh, now, if you're already finishing one up, you're already under contract, then you are fully within your rights to go ahead and finish it up under the 2016 standards. Uh, a couple comments in that regard. I don't think there's anything in the 21 standards that will increase your uh, cost beyond what it was in the 16 standards. Um, so that's one reason you'll get clients who say, yeah, I know about the 21 standards, but I sure like those 16s. I, that's what I want you to do it as. Um, I think they usually say that for one of two reasons. One is they didn't know there were 21 standards and so they're embarrassed. So they wanna act like they like the old ones better. Uh, the other reason is because they think the new standards will cost more. And, uh, and both of those are not, not valid reasons. So if you are under a new contract, um, you know it's gotta be to the 21 standards. Now, I would suggest some of you are gonna be involved in a, in a deal where you did the survey, you finished it two weeks ago to the 16 standards. It didn't close, now you delivered it because they said it was gonna close two days later. It didn't close and now six weeks from now, you're gonna get contacted and they're gonna say, hey, we're, we're all set to close now, but it's been eight weeks and uh, you know the lender wants this thing updated. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the word update, I hate that word. But um, in a case like that, I think you have to be careful. I think if the deal truly did not close, then in my mind, you could legitimately do that little update to the 16 standards because it really is just, you know, the same deal. It just never closed. <coughs> On the other hand, I think you need to be careful because they will tell you it didn't close when actually it did. And, um, and they're flipping it six weeks later and they're trying to get you to change all the names and pretend like actually, you know, oh, it's, this is all perfectly innocent. You can go online and, and probably see if it actually <clears throat> changed hands. And if it did, this is a, a new conveyance. It's a new survey. It needs to be done to the 21 standards. Um, the only other exception on uh, the transition is that somebody asked, the lenders asked me today, uh, does, is HUD aware of this? Is Fannie Mae aware of this? I'm like, I don't know. We can never figure out who to talk to uh, in those agencies ever since 1999. <clears throat> so I don't know if, uh, if they're aware of it. In 2011, um, the lean, or the uh, lean 232 people, the, um, the nursing home types of properties, they had a new set of standards out almost immediately. So they were fully tuned in. Uh, the multifamily HUD requirements didn't change until about September. Uh, in 2016, I don't know whatever happened, lean 232, but the multifamily, it, it, uh, it, did, it took them a while and it was even hard to find those even later on. 
So, um, you know, I, I don't know if they know about this. Um, we can try to, in fact, I had said I was going to get a hold of uh, <clears throat> John Palatiello, who is, um, you know, has a lobby firm that NSPS uses and see if we can uh, contact HUD and Fann Fannie Mae and at least aware them of these standards. So that's, uh, that's what I have on the transition. Got it. Um, Mike, did you still have a question or did you put it in the chat? No, I, I do. It's like, <clears throat> I think that uh, somehow the word hasn't got out to the different state professional societies. I, <clears throat> I sent a email to our president today, encouraging him to get an email out, informing all the members of the society that we have changed uh, standards and to also post those to our society's website because we maintain a pretty good uh, resources uh, out there for the surveyors. Uh, I'm sure Gary and his different uh, presentations at conferences and so forth, but maybe during the big seven conference here coming up, uh, we can make sure that we hit that. Are you, Gary, are you presenting on this at the big seven? Oh. Uh, yes, yes, I am. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I've presented probably in. Uh, I don't know, a, a dozen states or so since they, since October. So, uh, and, and there's been a couple articles and, and I've done uh, uh, Surveyor Says a couple of times and that's been in news and views. So, you know, if people are paying attention, they would know, but we know uh, we're getting pulled 18 directions all the time. So we're not always able to read everything, uh, but we're doing what we can to make sure people are aware of it. Um, on the uh, NSPS website, under again, under resources, standards, uh, ALTA, NSPS, uh, Trish did this today. There, the third selection is archives, and we have now moved the 2016 standards to the archives. Uh, she also found, I told her I had the 62 standards, but they were not listed. So we now have every old version. If for some reason you need to know what the earlier versions looked like, we also have this uh, 1985 version, which was not a joint document. That was just an ACSM document. Uh, and I don't know how much that was ever used, but we have all of these older sets of standards and, uh, and a bunch of columns that I've written over the years on that. So, uh, so that's a good resource. Again, nsps.us.com uh, over here on resources, standards, ALTA, NSPS. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. I have run long so oh, no, you're, you're good you're good um we'll go back to the stuff in the chat because it was all pertaining to 11 section 11 so all right yeah let's uh let's find that <clears throat> um travis says definitely should talk to someone from your local 811 regarding design versus dig tickets dig tickets can be fined if filed without meeting certain requirements Ohio yeah. is basically unable to do a dig ticket without a white line. Yeah, uh, that's the case in a lot of places. And if you report uh, that you're, uh, you know, using explosives to get them out there, then you could be in trouble for that. We have been told in Indiana in no uncertain terms that driving something into the ground more than two inches is excavation and that a hammer is not a hand tool. So uh, for what that's worth, that's what we're dealing with in Indiana. Uh, but yeah, you, everybody needs to be aware of the, you know, the, the design ticket request was intended to help uh, with the problems that we have. And at least in my experience, it's not helpful at all. Uh, it just gives them two or three weeks to not respond instead of uh, uh, two days to not respond. Um, it's, yep. uh, it's just not a, a helpful thing. Uh, again, if it works for you, then negotiate the change and, uh, and you know, tell your client that uh, we can do an 811. It might be effective for us, but uh, for many, many of us, it's just, it's just not a, an effective thing to do. We have a client that uh, asked for a design ticket to be pulled on every project, and I refuse to do it because of the that aspect, right? You have to go out, you got to paint it in white. Then you'd have to make a return trip back to the site. Well, we don't want you to do a return trip to the site. Well, I'm not going to do a design ticket and say we pulled one and then never return back to the site. So um, I just won't, that's just one of my things. I won't do it for them, but, and you know, some of them do it for them and some of them won't. So I just refuse to do it. Yeah. Uh, 
it's it's crazy um sean says uh white paints we you touched on a little bit white paints are still a, considered an approximate location of underground which you had brought up earlier with plus or minus a couple feet so yeah yeah um leaf timing is so often the issue but here in california we try to get the client to do a location first even when it comes to even a design topo survey as well yeah meaning uh yeah, and, and and again, in some areas, I know it is effective. I there is one state where they they get great service from eight one one, but uh, based on the comments I get from people, it's not very effective in most places. Yeah, definitely not here in Nevada as well. Um, same thing, you know, not going on the private properties, that kind of stuff. So we've got uh, city, one of our city jurisdictions here refuses to do line locates for surveyors, you know, or anything. It's not supposed to be used for design level and. So they just won't even show up, but yeah. I'd like to, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. This is Leif. Um, even, uh, I did a lot of work for a firm out of Arkansas and they did international or, you know, across the country, ALTAs. And it was blow and go, you know, type of attitude about all these. And so you get that mixture of that uh, along with those of us who, you know, want to provide a full content for, the client so you know that's the type of thing that happens and uh i do know that more and more now uh especially in design topos we try to get the ut guys out there to paint marks and then you just locate them you locate them you present them on your map try to show a definitive uh designation and then those can always be compared to as built information that you get from public agencies mm -hmm. um yeah, thank you. Uh, Leif, I see that you had one comment about can we make an exception within the plat as to uh, wh which issue were you talking about? Well, no, just, just in the general utility notations that, you know, do you, how extensive do you want to be in that notation? Yeah. Based on what information that you have to provide the client. Right. You no, know, is right. it just, well, we, we, like you said, and I heard you say it, do we, do we just note that we went out and we searched? Yes, we saw this, boom. Or do we, Say further location can be, you know, accomplished by you doing this or tell them that or that type of thing. Right. I, I think, you know, if, uh, it, you know, and to some extent it depends, if it's a regular client of ours and we know what they're going to be doing with that property, they're going to be developing it versus it's just a conveyance, then uh, we're probably going to take care of our client and say, hey, you know, we might want to do a little extra because I know that utilities are going to be an issue versus it's just a conveyance and you know they they check the item off uh because they uh they thought it sounded great um uh, i i have an email i use uh that someone sent me one time where they had sent table a off to their client and they said hey you need to tell us which items they that you want and the email came back and it said oh by the way regarding table a we want all the items that don't cost anything okay. um now you know in, in my book, there's a brilliant way to decide what table A items you want, right? Uh, and, and so it's just. Uh, um, well, that's a, you know, that, I remember doing, you know, because I've done so much work. Uh, first, inter, you know, first American titles. Big time, you know, doing this but the thing now with COVID, uh, we're going to see an uptick in ALTAs. You're going to see a huge number. And uh, if you already haven't seen it, because a lot of business is going out, you know, centers i did one up by trent i did the the uh, dignity health uh, up there by the hospital in henderson there and stuff and that thing has done it gone through three times uh medical center and all that especially you know cnm commercial manufacturing stuff because you know places are going out of business so you're going to see a lot of alta uptick in those certain areas and, you know, you get, like I said, I, I've worked for some firms that, uh, yeah, they're a little shady on how they, you know, provide that and they just run through it and boom. And then, you know, me as a, as a owner, or that type of thing, I, yeah. I tend to have a little more dignity about what I'm providing the client. So. Is it free item, uh, item zero in table A? Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if I had got that email, I would have said, well, apparently you don't want any of them. Yeah, you know, exactly. uh, 
in my book, in my book, every table, you want an address, that's 50 bucks, right? I, mean, I, I think everything should cost something. I mean, how many attorneys do you know? Oh, I need an affidavit. I'll take that care of that for you. I won't charge you anything. Right. Uh, we're apparently the only ones who do stuff like that. So I, I got to tell you, Gary, I do have a copy of, of the ALTA standards uh, from back in the 70s. That's when I first started. So I have it on file. I just kept it because I go, you can only get better from here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a base standard and boom, but still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I see a comment about the. Uh, uh, the FAQs, yeah, there are, uh, I have several example type of notes, but I really like the, the note that we have written after table A item 11. Uh, that is written so you literally could clip that out and just stick it, I like to put it right in the contract, right? So the client has signed a contract and it has that note. We're just controlling their expectations uh, to say, you know, guess what? You're not gonna get accurate, complete, and reliable information. It's just not going to happen unless you excavate the whole site. Have you, um, have you ever come back later with an addendum type issue? Uh, with respect to like utilities? To whatever, you know, you know to your to the table your aids. Yeah. Yeah, just to the table aids in general. Yeah, to the tables to come back. You notice with, within a few weeks, boom. Oh, or, uh, no, we have, we have not done that. And um, I think that um, you know we try to avoid doing that kind of thing. We actually had a, a, a pretty good suggestion just a week ago that really uh, wasn't going to change anything, but it was going to kind of clean up some stuff, um, just like in indent, in indentations and numbering and that. And we decided, no, this is already out there. We don't want to create a, a monster. So, uh, do you keep that information? Uh, you, you made a comment about, well, if, you know, after a period of time, it, if the uh, title company doesn't accept it or it stalls or that, and then it, or it goes to a sale again, and then you're to provide another ALTA, you add that to that next time. Oh, um, to the upgrade. I, I, I thought you were talking about a, an addendum to the standards themselves. No. No, this is to, to your own map. I'm to the oh yeah, sure. I I uh, wouldn't have a problem at all doing that. I think if uh, every now and then you know you look at something, you go, God, I wish I had you know had a note on that, or wish I uh, said something about that. Uh, and every you know every now and then that opportunity comes along, and uh, and so you have a chance to uh, you know to add something that maybe you didn't have. Yeah, on you, you actually answered a, a, the question while I was asking it, but yeah, it's, you can't make an addendum that'd be another another five years oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 uh yeah the yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, exactly. uh, potholing you know yeah yeah somebody uh, uh, you know i i was just a consultant in a case about a year ago where um, a building got built uh, about six inches from a high pressure gas line uh and um and they did not apparently do a utility locate. Uh, and actually the corner of that building got torn out and moved back. So the building now has a notch in the corner. Um, you know, if, if, if uh, utility locates are critical to somebody, then uh, I think you'd like to think most people know this, but you know, there are technologies out there, whether it's hydro or pot, you know, whatever, uh, that we can get accurate locations in specific spots uh, on utilities. So, uh, well, not know. even just utilities. You know, we concentrate on those most of the time because those are the standard for design. But I remember back I was working for a firm, Hall and Foreman, here in California, in the office, and uh, we were doing the plot for the, the building design area. And actually, there was a easement for a 24-inch storm drain. And uh, got missed, and the building corner got placed over that easement. And uh, at first, they were, you know, all this mumbo jumbo about it. But then, you know, it got caught. And it got rectified, but still, yeah, it's easy enough to do some of that stuff. Information is hard, you know. There's so many different outlets for it for you to gather it all in and get it all. And the title company is not always going to provide you with the most accurate stuff even though they try to tell you it's up to date yeah 
Yeah. Mike, you got another question? Well, just a follow up comment on that. And then Gary kind of touched on it. So it's kind of a slippery slope. You have to, you know, this is really for a land title conveyance, right? We're doing a survey. So the purchaser is aware of all the facts of the property versus a design survey, right? So, yeah. you know, and Gary said, well, it might be a client that you know, and you know what they want to do with the, what they're going to do with the development. So, you know, it's, it's really hard for us as surveyors, because a lot of times you're thinking, well, you know, we're thinking about, we do a lot of site development surveys, and that's what they need. But really, we need to be thinking about it in the land title sort of perspective of, well, you know, what the survey is all about. And right. And in my that program, recline for a design survey, so you're going to notch building corners off, then pay us to do that. Right. Yeah, exactly. And the uh, the lead in paragraph to table A talks about that issue. And when I do my program in uh, uh, in um, well, I won't be in, I'll be in my uh, TV studio here in my back bedroom, but uh, I talk at length about uh, what this survey is for. And I and I talked to the uh, to the mortgage attorneys today about that too. You know, this survey exists because of title insurance and because of what lenders what coverage they want on their title policy. That that's why these standards exist. Uh, so you know, if somebody is planning on using it as a design survey. Um, I, I want to know that because I'm probably going to either charge them a boatload more money because a design survey is not a land title survey, or I'm going to tell them, you know, or, or I'm going to put a note on the survey that says uh, what the purpose of it is. Now, I know in some states like Illinois, you can't, you know, qualify your survey like that, but uh, I don't want it to be misused, uh, not for my benefit, but for their benefit. Exactly. Well, well said, because we're here to protect the public. So that's, that's a clear distinction. You know, it's like, you got an apple and orange here. It's not a design survey. It's a land title survey. Yeah, right. Exactly. George, is that a clap or is that a question? <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> muted. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's a comment. And I think as, as far as, as Alta surveys go, we could do a great service to our clients by advising them of number one, what we can do as surveyors for them with an Alta survey, but number two, what we can do for them with a relationship with a quality title company, because it's really a team effort to get this project done. There are good title companies and there are bad title companies. And, and I know for a fact that I'll get a request to do a survey for someone and, and they'll tell me who their title company is. And I, it immediately tells me I don't want to be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a great partnership that you can develop and, and we can make each other both look good with our, for our client by, by leading them to choose a good title company and then providing them with a quality service. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure as most of you know that typically they've already selected their title company, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I know people here in Indianapolis who I'm thrilled to work with and I know others, I'm like, yeah, they, uh, you know, they, they could have done themselves a favor by picking somebody else, but uh, they're gonna pick who they pick. And uh, the, the title uh, industry is extremely competitive uh, and, and there's, you know, issues related to that too, but uh, in any event, yeah. Yeah, good, good points, George. It's always funny where money gets involved. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Anybody got more questions for Gary? Before we let him go and- Thank you, Thank you Gary. Uh, you are very welcome. I appreciate the opportunity to come back on again. Of course, and, thank uh, you, sir. Uh, we'll hopefully we'll come up with something else I can uh, I can uh, enlighten you all with sometime down the road. But uh, you know if you're if, uh, eventually we'll be all back in person again. So make sure you come up and say hi and uh, and I'll be online in the meantime. So join me if you can. Absolutely. Mike had, Mike had one more. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's just a kudos. I, I read the standards actually this morning and everything I saw, I just said right on. I mean, it's a, it's a great improvement. May not cover everything, but it's it helps us, I think, as surveyors. So thanks, Gary, for all your work and NSPS and whoever was involved with the committees and all the input and stuff. That was really good. Yeah, good. Thank you, Mike. It's uh, it's always nice to get some some kudos. We we work hard at it. It's a very dedicated group, and uh, you know we're we're watching out for you all. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, uh, I'm real uh, fast, real fast. Trent, maybe you yeah. could put out for our uh, what the March gathering that we have out here in the West Coast yeah. area, or yep. You want to tell everybody that they can get online and join, you know, with the the conference we're having. Oh March. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, every email that I send out, it, uh, we talk about it on there. I've got the links on my email address when we send those out. So definitely um, I can throw it even in the chat. I think I got it right here. Here's the program. I'll throw it in the chat really quick. But um, there's the uh, conference, conference program right there. Uh, Danny had a question before we jumped off. Yep. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I noticed this when I performed... Uh, the Broncos Alta survey here in in uh, Denver, uh, it had over almost 170 exceptions, and quite a few of them repeated themselves, and it just kind of seemed like the title company just shotgunned, just pfft, stuck everything on there, hoping that we could sort it out for them. That was one of the first times that's ever happened to me. Is this kind of a typical thing, or is that just a good <laughs> example of a title company that just kind of dumped it all on and let the surveyor figure it out. Better turn that one off. I'm going to get angry. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, Gary. Uh, uh, don't mean to trigger anybody. I'm just curious if uh, this is a it, common it, occurrence. It, yeah, that that's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's probably a toss up as to what happened there. They may have been overwhelmed with everything, uh, but you know, the fact is that the title industry does not, those who have been around, I, I remember 40 years ago who we dealt with in the title industry and in and, and Indianapolis, and there were a bunch of really good people who knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not a slap at, at that, uh, at their industry, because the fact is that 40 years ago, we had uh, field crews who knew what the heck they were doing too. And not a slap at field crews, but w the technology allows us to send people out in the field who, you know, are, are great at locating things, but they, they, they really understand stuff that's going on and in some cases not. So, uh, you know, so the title industry really isn't that different from, from ours in that, uh, you know, things are going 800 miles and um, they may either have been relying on you to help them sort it out, or they just really didn't uh, have a good handle on what was going on. Uh, maybe a couple different things there. Okay. Here, in, here in Southern California, back in the 70s when I started, the first American mostly, but uh, several of the title companies would have a monthly, would be one of the participants of the monthly meetings with the CLSA. Uh, yeah. in the local chapters and they would come and say here's what we're doing that hasn't happened in quite a few years that i think going on now but that yeah that, that would be started out that way yeah uh, that would be a very helpful thing for for uh, the size societies to do and, and usually those sessions get uh, a bunch of surveyors showing up because we are interested in hearing what they have to say about what we do and how we interact so uh you know, that's something that every society ought to be uh, trying to pull in people like that. Well, they, they would be to the local chapter meetings and then uh, the monthly chapter meetings and then as well as the state. They would come and participate. And I don't know. I haven't been to, you know, because we have COVID now, but uh, I haven't seen a uh, title uh, one or two. First American mostly because they're big down there, but they would participate somewhat in the, the regional coming up here in March for us. Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, just one uh, thing that Leaf did talk about, the uh, conference I'm actually looking forward to. Uh, I had a presentation the other day for um, the Connect Me, which is going to be the, the platform for the network break uh, during the session and the evening network uh, and exhibit hall stuff. And that's, I'm really excited to actually see how that works out if anybody's ever seen that. But 
it's called the connect me and it's like M I I at the end of it. But that program is like i uh, I'll call it zoom on steroids. It's really cool looking. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun for those uh, attending the Western conference. 